We have 388 people and I'm pulling in our first speaker, Michael Gulli Santiago. Great. Uh, we are going in the same order yep. as it was in the list. Yep. And uh, we would ask all the speaker to summarize their talk in one, two minutes. And in the meantime, uh, other people can ask questions. Um, and we will ask those questions. So please go ahead. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Gulley Santiago, and I give a talk called uh, Applying Probabilistic uh, Inference to Astronomical Spectroscopy, uh, which is broadly the, the scenario when you have uh, a data spectrum, so a spectrum of a star, for example, observed with the telescope, and it has noise in it. Usually these are faint objects to begin with, or just they have some amount of, of finite noise. And uh, you want to derive astrophysical properties from that. Uh, and the, the complication is typically that you have uh, some uh, coarse grid that's pre-computed. It's so expensive to compute, you can't just iteratively uh, compare it in like an MCMC sort of loop or, or even a, a sci-fi minimize sort of thing. You have to um, do something a little more clever. And there's a framework called Starfish that we've um, worked on. And uh, yeah, I think it's really useful. Uh, it's recently been overhauled. So if, if it's something that you've heard of before, uh, then that, that might be of interest. Um, more broadly, I'm, I'm super jazzed about JAX. Uh, there was a talk by Jake Vanderplass about JAX. And so I've done, uh, I have a, a, a tutorial um, uh, Jupyter notebook that's um, referenced in the talk. Um, it's called uh, Fiat Luke's. I think it's github.com, brown dwarf slash um, Fiat Luke's. And uh, basically you can, um, solve for all of the Earth's absorption lines that, that sort of are a, a pesky signal. Uh, and you can you can solve that with GPUs and uh, an auto diff. And uh, we use NumPyro and stuff, so that's really cool. So I don't know if there's any questions, specific questions. Um, feel free to to ask in the little um, ask a question box where you can you can type a question. Um, I've shared the links to the slides on Google Slides, and in fact, I'll even um, I'll even post like a PDF, um, just in case people prefer that. I'll put that in the, in the slide window. So, any questions? Um, I'll yeah, shout out. So that oh, yeah. I can ask the questions. So the first question is, how does variation and inference work for modeling? So we, so astronomers for some reason, at least in my experience, don't use variational inference a lot. I think it might just be sort of a, a culture thing or sort of, you know, prevailing um, sort of tools. Uh, I don't think there's any deep reason why not, but, um, but uh, really MCMC is sort of the, the name of the game. I think maybe part of it is that we have relatively, um, and I'm no expert in, in variational inference, but, but uh, my, my picture is that uh, we have sort of dense solutions to our problem. So in other words, um, th there's strong correlations among parameters. So, so I think that might be a problem with variational inference, but again, not an expert. Um, can you explain how TensorFlow is applied on the spectral lines that are used during the process of removals of the atmospheric lines or during the process of the radio velocity measurements? Okay, so this question is referring to Wable, which is written by uh, Meg Bedell. Um, but I am familiar with it, and uh, there's a paper there. Uh, but, br but briefly, the question is, how is TensorFlow used? So Wobble is sort of slick in the sense that it it, it basically is deriving what the templates are. And so it's, um, it's essentially deriving what the pixel by pixel by pixel uh, signal is uh, for, your, for your stellar template. And then it assumes that if there's any signal that's changing on top of that, it must be toloric spectrum. Uh, and so TensorFlow is used as sort of like the, the gradient descent where you're inferring the, like each pixel is a parameter of your model. And you're, since you have like maybe dozens of spectra, you can sort of um, look at, break apart the static signal from the part that's moving, which must be the Earth signal. So I, I hope that answers your question. If not, there's, um, there's certainly the, um, the, the framework out there. How do things like resolution? Oh, is that enough time? Yeah, no, there is enough time. I just meant to ask a question, but it's fine if you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why don't you pick? Because, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, right, yeah. Right now, there are no votes on any of those, but oh, okay. if, if people prefer different order, then just go ahead. So, how do you think like resolution, signal to noise, metallicity interplay with accuracy, especially around things like continuum fitting? Um, yeah. So, so continuum fitting is um, is I think one of the virtues of Starfish. So, so one of the issues. So. One of the issues with continuum fitting is like, where's the continuum? And especially in sort of M stars and some of these really cool brown dwarfs that I deal with, there's essentially no continuum. It's all pseudo continuum. Um, uh, so the cool thing of starfish is that as the models, insofar as the models are good, you, you're really warping the entire uh, whole spectrum to, um, to your continuum fit. And so you're actually technically including the uncertainty attributable to, to continuum estimation in your marginalized um, distribution. I think things um, in applications that, so I actually know Julie who's asking the question, um, her applications have historically been like really precise low metallicity stars and stuff. I suspect in those applications, you're probably better off doing sort of like the sort of stuff she's done in the past, which is like equivalent with type analyses or like mood where you like do it by eye because you can get really better precision. Um, there, there might be some cases where there's like a, a balance point. Um, a lot of the applications where I've done Starfish have been applicable where like we really don't have good um, uh, like template spectra and stuff like that. I don't know if that answers. Ask another question if you, if it doesn't. Uh, so the next one is after running the algorithm to clean out that's atmospheric noise. Oh, it's gone. Where is it? Yeah, I see it. Uh, I see. Do you do you save that clean data and start starting point for future researchers? Yes. Yeah. So in other words, um, usually the the atmospheric noise is considered a pre-processing step, and and once you're done with that, you can sort of save the spectrum. Um, I'm I'm very in some sense I'm very much a Bayesian where I think like everything should be solved simultaneously, and so ideally we would we would fit the atmosphere um, simultaneously because there's some uncertainty associated with that also. Um, but but often people just divide by like a reference to our spectrum, and that's good enough for most purposes. So. Yeah. Okay, so neat talk. Uh, how did you find a global and local component of the covariance matrix? Yeah, okay, so the global component of the covariance matrix are fit with two parameters typically, so uh, a scale length and an amplitude, uh, and those are fit simultaneously in, in the MCMC loop. Um, and so, so those are like self-consistently fit. The local components are a bit ad hoc, and I don't think there's any real principled way to, to do that. You just more or less say, oh, there's an outlier here. You pick some threshold. It, it's not really a Bayesian thing. We don't like probabilistically do it. We just say, oh, well, wherever there's a, a big uh, outlier, we're going to just instantiate a local kernel. Um, yeah. Uh, and our last question and last call for the last question. In many astronomical algorithms, you need to interpolate or resample data. I have found, however, that these operations are not easily available in HMC samplers, which depend on automatic differentiation. Would you recommend a tensor library which supports these operations? And what, what is your opinion on the matter? Yeah, so I recently implemented something like this for um, the Fiat Luke's library, which is referenced in the talk. Um, and I posted the slides to, uh, I think so, uh, right here. Oops. So here's the, oops, I already took that much. Um, so I, yeah, there is a way to do it. And Jax was just um, implemented a binning. Um, and so for, for the resampling, I basically use uh, convolution, which is generally available and like an MCMC sampler, like any auto diff package will, will have a, a convolution, um, but also a binning and um, Jax just implemented, in fact, uh, like a few, like last week or a couple of weeks ago, Jake Vanderplas implemented like a bin function in Jax, which is um, exact identical to the NumPy version and that will be compatible with the with the HMC sampler. So uh, so I recommend Jax and NumPy Um okay and then the last question is do you have any suggestions for tutorials, libraries in Python that can be used to extract the spectroscopy of stars observed by TESS? Uh yeah so um 
Uh, I guess I would say, I mean, Starfish and so far, you know, I, I recommend it's, um, you know, try it out. Uh, it should be easier to use nowadays with the, the most recent API update. Um, and otherwise for extraction is almost another layer of like the, the pre-processing steps. Um, there's some, uh, AstroPy has affiliated packages that might be useful there. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of library a lot of telescopes all host their own sort of customized stuff because every spectrograph's a bit different. So yeah. Okay. Is that okay. my time? Yes. So okay. thank you very much. Thank and you all. And see you around. Bye bye. All right. So why don't you tell us about your talk? Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Um, and thank you so much for listening to my talk. Uh, and yeah, I will summarize it in a minute or two. And so I was talking about uh, PIOS code, um, which is a package that I developed, um, and it's a package that implements a numerical method to solve um, a type of ordinary differential equations. What's special about the differential equations is that they have highly symmetry solutions. Um, the method is very efficient at solving this particular type of equation, um, and hopefully you can see my slides. Um, the equations I'm talking about take uh, this third form, so the third equation on this slide. Um, and these are basically equations describing uh, single dimensional harmonic oscillators with uh, time dependent frequency and optionally a time dependent damping term. So these equations, while, while the class may seem somewhat narrow, these are actually very common uh, in physics. And so in the talk, I uh, brought some examples from physics and maths. Um, not only that, uh, there are not really any tools in uh, big numerical libraries or scientific computing libraries to deal with the type of rapid oscillations that can occur um, in the solutions of these equations. So and this is what motivates the existence of this package. Um, the, the basic idea behind the algorithm um, is that it, given some initial conditions, it steps through the, the solution at each step forecasting the solution with either of two methods. And the algorithm picks whichever method gives you the larger step size, so whichever method allows you to take the, the least number of steps uh, in the entire solution. And one of the methods um, is kind of a more traditional approach that you may find in um, in the methods underlying scipy.integrate.solve.ivp, um, which is based on the Taylor expansion of the solution. Um, so this is what I have up here. Um, and the other type um, is not common in numerical solvers, but it is extremely common in physics. So this is called the WKB approximation, and it's an analytic approximation for oscillatory functions. So you can describe oscillatory functions in advance very well. Um, I had this slide, which shows you uh, this approximation in, in orange, fitting um, the underlying black line at sort of increasing orders um, um, of accuracy. And so this is what allows the algorithm to be very efficient at solving these equations, because it can take these large steps traversing many wavelengths at a time. Um, I tried to make uh, this package look as close as possible to something that you might find in SciPy. Um, and it is open source. Um, it is being prepared for submission to JOS. And um, it, it offers uh, dense output as an advanced feature. Awesome. It was, it was a very nice talk, that, and I encourage everyone to look at it. Um, <laughs> nice flashbacks to quantum mechanics and WKB as I was, as I was watching it. We have some questions. Um, first up, I guess you work on sea ice prediction. And so people are asking what the link between cosmology and sea ice prediction, your other <laughs> GitHub project is. All right. Okay. Um, so the link is, is my PhD. Um, very vaguely. So I'm, I'm a PhD student who's doing uh, a CDT studentship, um, which includes a six month industrial placement. And uh, during that placement, I couldn't work on anything that was related to my thesis. So I went into something completely different. And, um, and that's why uh, this yes, prediction is up there. <laughs> 
I worked okay. for the British Antarctic Survey. Awesome. Your, your notebook for that was posted in our chat, so I'll take a look at oh. that later. Um, there was a question, do you have plans to interface with SymPy? So in particular, write the ODE in SymPy and then use your package as the back end to integrate. Okay. That, is that a suggestion or a question? Uh, well, it was a question. So if you would like oh, to... Are there plans? Are there plans? That's right. I haven't thought of that, but it is a, it's, a, it's a good suggestion. So I will yeah. definitely consider it. Um, uh, if... Can I see the names of uh, who asked the questions? Because I could then oh, yeah. maybe if, reach if out you to them. You also click on the ask a question okay. and you should be able to see them. That was Kelvin Lee. Okay. Uh, I invite him on the screen so he can. Uh. Um, along those lines, I thought it was great that you used as close to the solve IVP uh, interface as you could just to make it nice and easy to adapt. Um, you showed comparisons to SciPy's um, fourth order Rungakata. Did you also, yeah. I'm just curious, cause I, I work on stiff stuff. Did you try the stiff integrators and do those fail horribly as well that are part of um, SciPy? Yeah, so um, I mean, as, so as far as I understand, this is uh, not, quite something so my solver is not something that you could use on stiff equations um, no, no. although i haven't tried um and so um i guess i was asking the opposite though the so opposite. all right okay so you tried your equation with just solve ivp mm -hmm. uh using the runga but yeah. they also have an option to use a stiff solver so if you oh, yeah. try the stiff solver on this equation would it f fail horribly in a plus solver? I'm not sure. I haven't tried that actually. I tried the other option, El Soda, um, because yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very commonly used one as well. It's um, used in Mathematica, yeah. um, and uh, that that didn't work very yeah. well either. But no, I haven't. I haven't tried stiff solvers actually. Um, uh, another question in the comments: Can you mm -hmm. comment on error analysis too? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, error analysis, so the, the way the, you know, error is estimated in the algorithm is really quite gory. So um, I would refer to you to the paper that's in my slides. Um, but, and I'm not sure by error analysis, uh, they mean the sort of how the internal error, how the local error is estimate, estimated, or just kind of how that is related to the actual error of uh, the solver. Yeah, um, I, I would. Um, I would interpret that as how you would do the internal error estimate as your, you know, to pick your time step. Yeah. Okay. So in in Runge Kata methods, which is one of the sort of internal methods that the algorithm uses, uh, this is done by uh, or via embedded methods. So um, there are a number of kind of evaluations of the right hand side of the ordinary differential equation. And those are combined, um, linearly combined differently to give a kind of a, say, a fifth order estimate and then a fourth order estimate. So kind of a different levels of accuracy. And the difference between the two um, gives you an error estimate on, on the answer. Um, and I'm doing a similar thing with um, the method that's used for the WKB steps. Um, and... Um, so there, there are two sources of error there. One is the fact that the WKB approximation needs to be truncated at some point. Um, and, and so, you know, it's not, we are not um, necessarily truncating at the most um, ideal point. So maybe you, you would need to go to like fifth, five, six, seven terms, but we are truncating at four. So that's one source of error. Um, the error from that can be estimated by basically taking the last term and that um, you can sh it can be shown that that um, approximates the relative error on that step really well and the other the other issue is that or the other source of error is that kind of numerical integrals um, primarily the the integral evaluating the kind of the zeroth order term um, which um, kind of determines the phase of the solution um, and that's done with a numerical integration method that also gives an error estimate yeah. in a similar way to Runge-Kutta. So, 
um, I fold those two errors together, take whichever is larger and use that as the a kind of error estimate on WKB steps. Um, okay, we have oh, another question. Can you can it handle superposition destruction of two waves? Ooh, um, let me think about that. Superposition of structure of the two waves. So as long as the equation is of the form um, that I showed where there is um, kind of a, a frequency term, and I guess the superposition of terms or a superposition of um, waves would be kind of two separate frequencies somehow added together, then yeah, that's fine. Um, and destruction of waves, uh, yeah, destruction would work as well. So if, if that happens and the solution is no longer oscillatory, then, then it would just switch back to being a kind of a traditional runger cutter solver. And I guess I had just one comment, maybe question. Since you did all that work to make it work with basically the solve IVP interface, have you thought about doing it as SciPy has like the affiliate um, SciKit packages, right? So mm -hmm. sort of making it more formally, easily discoverable by um, SciPy package users. I don't know much about how that works, but there's probably someone on here that does. Yeah, me neither, but I would be interested to learn more about that. I, I haven't thought about that at all. So the, the idea was that it, um, despite it kind of being most suitable for this kind of set class of equations, um, it could be um, maybe integrated to, into SciPy integrate.solve IVP as one of the right. methods that are available. Yeah, and, I think yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you around for the sprint over the weekend? Yeah, it can be. So, yeah, it might be worth talking to the SciPy developers. Uh -huh. uh, so would this be in the, yeah, in just the SciPy sprint rather than the AstroPy one? Uh, yeah, I think, so. yeah. Uh, there are so many sprints. I, I can't remember yeah. whether there is a SciPy or not, but yeah, uh, there is definitely a NumPy. Um, and it's confusing SciPy the package and SciPy the conference, isn't it? So. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess there is a SciPy, but I can double check. So uh, time is up. So uh, we would move to our next speaker. Unfortunately, I can't yet see Martin on the list of people. Uh, Maybe so, wave. so if you are here, Martin, please wave. Uh, otherwise, we go ahead with Calvin and then come back to Martin. So bye, Frugina. Okay, bye bye. Okay, so my name is Kelvin. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll sum up my talk, but before I do that, I'd like to thank the reviewers, the organizing committee, and I guess everyone involved in SciPy, including the chairs and like my fellow speakers for making my first uh, SciPy very, very memorable. Uh, so I gave a talk on a uh, package that we've been working on at the CFA, uh, called Pi Spectrals, which is supposed to be designed for uh, in with the with Pythonic and uh, deep learning workflows in mind to analyze broadband spectra. And so uh, Alex McLeod was a uh, Latino initiative student who worked with us uh, last year who helped prototype a lot of the deep learning uh, materials. And uh, Mike is my uh, postdoctoral advisor. Uh, so just I'll, I'll, I'll gloss over a lot of things, but just to uh, remind everyone that I'll give a very broad overview of what we're looking at. So we're looking at radio astronomical data, um, given the fact that, uh, as we saw in the keynote, there's a lot that you can actually do with uh, radio astronomy. Um, and the thing that we're particularly interested in is uh, actually looking for molecules in space using uh, radio astronomy. Um, so I'm going to gloss over this. Uh, so the idea is that we obtain uh, radio spectra, like the one shown here, and our job as uh, spectroscopists and astronomers is to figure out what these lines are. Um, and some some of you have seen spectra from uh, previous talks, and they typically, uh, well, all the ones that I've seen so far at the conference have been uh, either uh, atomic or um, transitions with uh, relatively 
uh, well, simpler characteristics. Uh, when we're dealing with molecular spectra, especially towards uh, sources or towards lines of sight that are very, very uh, complicated, like towards uh, the galactic center, uh, our line, our spectra become very, very uh, complicated and uh, what's called the line confusion limited, where there are basically spectral features everywhere you look. And uh, new facilities aren't helping the fight because they're just uh, enabling us to collect even more data more quickly. And so the idea is that uh, in, I believe, this year or, or next, depends on uh, what the schedule is for WSMA, but we're soon going to be able to collect uh, this much spectra, this much bandwidth uh, in a single acquisition. And so there's plenty of uh, space for discovering uh, new molecules and discovering uh, or characterizing physical environments by analyzing these molecular spectra. Um, and so the way that Pi Spectals works is, I'll head right to the end. Uh, what we're doing with Pi Spectals is trying to provide a familiar abstraction to spectroscopists and astronomers for analyzing the data. So we provide some rudimentary uh, abilities to perform digital signal processing using SciPy backends, as well as other um, open source, uh, part of the NumPy ecosystem. Um, and the, the pure Python part that we're implementing in PySpectools is just general routines that help keep track of spectroscopic assignments and as a whole improve the reproducibility of experiments. So, uh, sorry, of analysis. So the idea is uh, because we're dealing with hundreds to thousands of lines and every line corresponds to a different transition of some other molecule, um, there's a there's a real reproducibility crisis where how do you ensure that your analysis is going to be the same the next time you look at your spectra uh, in the analog fashion, which would be on pen and paper. Um, and more of a recent improvement are we're currently developing uh, deep learning backends using uh, PyTorch uh, to help improve the rate of discovery through these uh, spectra, both in terms of um, just feeding it a bunch of frequencies and asking it what it thinks, uh, which lines, which frequencies, uh, and which peaks form a, a set together, as well as identifying what the possible molecule is based on the rotational parameters that we derive from fitting these peaks. And uh, we published a couple of papers using PySpec tools in the last uh, year, over the last year or so. And you're more than welcome to uh, check out the uh, um, GitHub. And I'm, I would like to also say that like, uh, I would welcome anyone to come along and uh, either adapt it for their own needs or come ask me if you have an idea and you want to try and uh, adapt PySpec tools to what you'd like to use it for. So with that, I think I'll open it up to questions. Uh, OK, so please keep the questions coming. And uh, I would go ahead and ask the first one. So I've seen that you are using Gustra Query in the package. And uh, uh, it's more like a comment than a question. Uh, we would be very much interested in if you are interested uh, uh, contributing from the molecular spectroscopist uh, point of view to AstroQuery. So if there are more databases, uh, both Adam and I would be very much interested in. Yeah, definitely. So we're, we're, we're normally as a, uh, as a lab at the CFA, we're typically the primary producers of the data. So the frequency lists and whatnot. And so we've actually talked a little to uh, Tony Ramajan who, uh, manages Splatalog, which is one of the uh, Astro Query uh, well, backends. I don't know what, <laughs> so one of the uh, query uh, yeah. targets by Astro Query. And so, yeah, we, we, we should probably talk to work out whether or not there's a way that we can uh, potentially push new experimental data up quickly so that you can use Astro Query or Splatalog to, yeah, you know, there is definitely a way for that. Mm -hmm. and, and we would be very much interested in, it, especially if it's coming from the data producer, because <laughs> then we can go around of the uh, reverse engineering parts that we put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see that questions are coming. Um, 
we go with the first one. Great talk, Calvin. Uh, can you say a bit more about the step in your workflow where it's decided that it's a molecule A instead of a molecule B? Ah, so right now, the way that PySpectors is implementing the, the automated assignment step, uh, it basically just works purely on coincidences and it does some back end uh, calculations of uh, weightings. So it will weight uh, lines that are predicted to be strong, so more predicted to be more intense, as well as uh, lower energy transitions uh, to be more likely. Uh, eventually, we'd like to implement maybe like a greedy. Uh, search where we're trying to maximize uh, the assignment of uh, one molecule over another, uh, where that may be more valid. But it, it ultimately very much depends on the the type of data you're looking at, whether or not um, you have to apply some intuition to determine whether or not molecule B exi should exist over molecule A, for example. Okay, so the next one is Great talk. Can you talk a bit on how easily can PySpec tools be adapted to UV optical absorption line spectroscopy? Yeah, so in, in principle, the way that PySpec tools is implemented, it's, it's wavelength agnostic. So um, you should be able to apply it to uh, any wavelength data. Um, the, the way that molecules may, are handled may need to be changed a little bit, but um, if anyone would like to take a crack at seeing if it breaks by spec tools, please do so and uh, maybe even submit a PR. Uh, thank you. Uh, so which communities in astrophysics are using spy spec tools? For example, Exoplanet, ISM, uh, this kind of overlaps with the previous question. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, primarily, it's being used by a lot of uh, uh, other uh, experimental groups like us who are producing um, uh, the, the line frequency data. Uh, I've, in the past, I've applied it to some uh, astronomical collaboration. So uh, we have typically they're all in the, in the uh, radio band, but we've looked at circumstellar shells and you could e just as easily apply this to you know dark molecular clouds as well. Basically, uh, it should be agnostic to what kind of uh, sources. But right now, the, the adoption in uh, the astrophysics communities are, are a little bit less because I guess I haven't promoted this package extensively yet. Uh, another question. In Bayesian models, which take spectra as input data, what is your... What is your strategy to account for spectrum regions which with lower with lower accuracy? For example, the spectrum edges versus central wavelengths. Also, how do you handle data inputs which can vary in intensity by more than an order? Uh, so right now, the the way that PySpectals is expecting inputs are uh, typically more already pre-calibrated, uh, pre-reduced data. So. Uh, we'll take spectra that are just x, y, um, relatively simple frequency and intensity, and it's kind of up to the, the user to uh, properly ensure that their uh, their spectral data are properly calibrated and reduced. Um, in terms of whether or not there, uh, we can handle regions that have, uh, for example, lower accuracy, uh, we don't have, we haven't encountered that encountered that use case yet. So, if you would like to, uh, um, if you would like to uh, say something more about that, we can talk offline. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, one more right. comment. I'm really hating myself to not having questions, but comments. Uh, but I heard feedback that people at the Radio Astro Tools uh, organization, it's like an organization of packages, are also very much interested in collaborating and working together with you and Spy Spec, Spec Tools. So hey, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. And very with much. this, uh, I would invite Monica Bobra to talk about SumPy. Uh, I'm also bringing Michael and the dog back in the meantime. The dog saw a bug, so she got scared. 
Oh, that's a pity. Yeah. Ah, uh, I have a sheep. Oh, Hello. Awesome. Just another pitch. All of the talks in this session were really awesome. So if you hadn't had a chance to watch them yet, go watch them. It was a great lot of talks. Uh, so with that, I would leave, leave the floor for Monica. Thank you, Rikita. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Monica Bober. I'm a research scientist at Stanford University, and I study the sun. Um, and my talk was about the SunPi project. So I gave a talk on behalf of the project. And SunPi is a package to analyze observations of the sun. So I thought I would give some context about what kind of solar observations SunPi is designed for. So in the U.S. alone, um, the NASA has, um, well, NASA has, NASA science has four divisions. I don't know. Everyone is familiar, astrophysics, heliophysics, earth science, and planetary science. So in the heliophysics division, NASA operates 19 space-based missions, six of which study the sun. And the National Science Foundation operates 10 facilities that take solar data. So with SunPi, we're trying to create a package that can analyze all of these disparate data using general purpose tools. Um, and we're really excited because we've done a lot in the last year. We finally crossed our 1.0 milestone after eight years of development last year in 2019. And we just released version 2.0. Um, we won a grant from NASA. We published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal and a companion paper in JOS. And we also surveyed the solar physics community about their software and hardware preferences and published that as well. So I'm happy to take any questions about anything kind of specific to SunPi Core, um, but also generally about applying for grants or publishing papers or conducting surveys. And I'd also like to say that Brigitte is a longtime con contributor to SunPi, so you can jump in here and answer questions too if you want. Thank you. Well, please have... Keep the I'll, questions coming. Oh, I'll start yeah. with one as we wait for, for others to, to pile in. It was a fantastic talk. I like the, the bit about the survey that you did with the community and seeing how, uh, how different people within the solar physics community use computing and what they did. Uh, the thing that's on my mind lately is GPUs. Uh, and you had that as a little tiny uh, um, segment in that plot when you surveyed the computing aspects. Has SunPi thought about GPU offloading, the, the need for that? Is there a need for that in the community? Um, well, SunPi doesn't post any data per se. So SunPi, for example, one of our, um, one of SunPi's uh, um, core functions is to just search and retrieve data. We have a, we have a module called FIDO for searching and retrieving data. So we don't store data, but I mean, yes, the solar physics community and heliophysics community could greatly benefit from the use of GPUs. We're building space-based and ground-based uh, instruments that are taking terabytes of data a day. So that talk that I, um, in, in the high-performance computing section about, um, I think by Roland Thomas. Oh, the Jupiter, Jupiter Hub at NERS. Yeah. Something like that would be absolutely wonderful to see on the NASA high performance computing um, uh, systems. And we don't have anything like that yet. So I think the community should definitely go in that direction. Cool. So do take a look at the talk and, and see this uh, nice survey they did just to see how they could help their community. It was very nice. And now we have some questions. Maybe uh, uh, Brigitte can. Yeah, okay. So going with the first one, can you talk about the process of getting so many organizations and labs to work together? Uh, how's that work well? Uh, what, is, what are the difficult parts? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And ultimately, I think something that we all think about in the, in the scientific Python community, because there are so many different people doing different things and, and not connected to one another. So I would say the most important thing is 
good old fashioned communication. Senpai has um, uh, developer meetings that anyone can join every week. There's also now an organization that started a couple years ago called Python and Heliophysics. And they have a meeting about every month. So it's not too heavy of a load to, to call into. And that I think is the most beneficial thing is to continue talking to each other so that you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, I, I will also say that, you know, I, I appreciate the question and that there is also um, resistance in the community, I think, to like collaborating together and people want to own their own code and own their own software and have their not, not develop in the open. So I think there's also this idea that we need to um, educate people on why that is enabling better science. Uh, I have a related question and use my moderator privileges. Oh, I wanted to bring up myself, Michael. Uh, so uh, I've seen in your talk that you highlight NASA missions and NSF uh, infrastructure. Uh, are there any plans to extend it to more into the international directions? Or I know that some of these are already international collaborations, but what about the facilities in other continents and um, yeah, yeah. so are there any plans to make it less US heavy and I, uh, I mean that is my fault. That is not the fault of the project. I am not I'm not saying it's a fault. Yeah. I'm just No, I, yeah. I'm just not I'm um I wanted to give context to how big the heliophysics community is because I know there's not a lot of representation here at Sci Pi. So I just wanted to give context. Um, that's why I talked about NASA and NSF. But certainly, like, SunPi has, has no borders, really. And so there are um, so many different ground-based and space-based missions from different countries um, that we support. You can actually get something like 90-something percent of all of the solar data that's currently being produced by all of the ground-based and space-based missions in the world right now through SunPi. So um, definitely not US-based at all. Okay, great. Uh, so next question from the audience. What would you say to planetary scientists interested in making a similar project for their film? Um, yeah, that is such a good question. Um, do it. I like, I think, um, do it. Uh, this the SunPi project is happy to help, and I'm I'm sure the AstroPi project is 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 happy to help. And um, yeah, I mean, go for it. I don't know. I don't know um, if you're looking for something a bit more specific, but I think that it enables interdisciplinary science. It enables reproducible science. I, I see no downside, and I think um, there are a couple people here. I think. Um, um, planetary pie there's someone from planetary pie here so i'm happy to talk and, and we can pull them in and see how to get started okay, so the next one is great talk monica and very useful tool for the community uh what are your thoughts about making a modernization of computational tools uh priority in the heliophysics community yeah i mean um i Fully and completely, totally agree with you that um, um, we should modernize our workflow. So I think I, one of the things I said in the talk is every scientific subdiscipline, everybody who's here today from all these different communities has a different culture. And for some communities, they have really adopted open source software, reproducible science, um, have been using GPUs to analyze large sums of data. Um, and other communities have been more slow to adopt. So I think looking at the wonderful science you can do using um, open source scientific software, like our, um, our, our the talk about the wonderful picture of the black hole, I think that's a very, very much most motivating factor to convince people to modernize their workflow. Uh, next question, is there a relationship between sunspot activity and global temperatures? Uh, that is very controversial, so I will just pass on that question. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, a very technical one. <laughs> I was just wondering about the current version of AI AI. Is it now able to produce the same level of 1.5 data that you can get with the solar soft code? Um, Maybe a yes. bit too, yeah. But, uh, yes, the answer is yes. And we're working on releasing a new version of AI Pi shortly. So yeah, we can talk more about that offline, but the short answer is yes. Uh, so any more questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, then, given that uh, Martin is unfortunately not in the audience, we have 10 extra minutes to uh, burn through. So, I would open up the floor for all our speakers again and any, any questions that our speakers uh, would be able to cover, not necessarily related to their talks, but to the work they're doing. Um, also, I think I think there were some posters associated with this. That if those people are around and want to say something, maybe they could wave and just draw some attention, right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, please wave in the chat. That would be the easiest for me to bring you uh, into the four people centrally. Um, and were, thank you, everyone. These were really awesome talks, and I learned a lot. They were all, all, all of them were awesome talks. I think it's a Friday afternoon effect, right? Virtual yeah. conferences are just as tiring as, as in person. Yeah. Uh, then I would like to just advertise again the sprint tomorrow. There will be uh, astronomy presence. Uh, AstroPi will be there. PolyAstro will be there. Maybe SunPi will be there. I'm not sure about that. Um, and also all these um, scientific Python based libraries will be there. Um, NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Psychic image. So please do come along. This is an excellent way of starting or continuing contributing and to hang around with, with people doing the, the work in these libraries. Um, so if there are no more questions, I think we call it a Friday afternoon. And thanks everyone for their attendance. Thanks everyone. <laughs>